Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It seems odd that in the ultra-competitive world of pro football, one individual record has stood the test of time and has not been broken in almost 91 years. A few attempts have come close, but unless something quite unusual occurs in the future, it is highly unlikely that this record will ever be broken. Now that's a fairly strong statement, but think about it. In the thousands of NFL games played since 1929, no one has ever equaled or surpassed the 40 points that Ernie Nevers of the Chicago Cardinals scored in one game on November 28, 1929. Nevers tallied a record six touchdowns all by rushing and kicked four extra points to compile those lofty 40 points. We do now know that both Gail Sayers of the Bears and Dub Jones of the Cleveland Browns each scored six touchdowns in a single game since Nevers did so in 1929. Dub Jones was the first to catch Nevers when he scored six TDs on November 25, 1951, as the Browns knocked off the Bears 42-21. Jones accumulated his touchdowns on four rushes and two pass receptions from quarterback Otto Graham. Fourteen years later, on December 12, 1965, the great Kansas Comet, Gale Sears of the Bears, haunted the 49ers with his six scores during the Bears' 61-20 drubbing of San Francisco. Sears scored four of his scores on the ground, added another via pass reception, and finished off his day with an incredible 85-yard punt return for a touchdown. And that was the last time that anyone in the NFL managed to equal the total of six touchdowns by Ernie Nevers. Although his six rushing TDs, along with his 40 points, both remain as the NFL standards to this day. And before we forget, who was the one person on hand for all three of those six touchdown scoring binges? You guessed correctly, it was Bears coach George Hallis. Sometimes we forget just how long Hallis was in the league. But before we get into the specifics of Ernie's big day, we'll take a quick look at his overall career and then try to determine what inspired Nevins to gobble up the Bears so convincingly in that Thanksgiving Day contest so long ago. Nevers first reached national acclaim as an All-American fullback at Stanford in 1925 under coach Pop Warner, who had also coached the legendary Jim Thorpe at Carlisle. When comparing the two talented backfield men, Warner stated, the best athlete I ever coached was not Jim Thorpe, it was Ernie Nevers. He was the greatest player the game has ever seen. The San Francisco Examiner later reported that the humble Nevers was quite uncomfortable with that comparison and simply explained that Jim Thorpe could do everything. Nevers did, however, admit that his worth ethic might have had something to do with his gridiron success as he recrowned his transition from lineman to backfield stud. Said Nevers, well, I'll give myself this much. I had unlimited energy. Oh, I had to put the work in. I was so lousy when I was in high school, they stuck me in the pit with the tackling dummy. I was too slow for the backfield, so I was a lineman. It wasn't until I got to Stanford that I was a fullback. After high school, Nevers was all set to enroll at the University of California, but late in the process, he decided to attend Stanford. As Nevers recalled, if I had gone to Cal, I would have stayed a lineman and nobody would have given me a chance. I was a terrible tackle. I guess I did much better as a fullback. 
His most famous collegiate outing was likely in the 1925 Rose Bowl against powerful Notre Dame with its four horsemen. In all honesty, Nevers probably should not have been on the field to face the Irish, since he had broken both ankles and missed most of the regular season. But he came back with both legs taped from the foot to the knee and played all 60 minutes in the loss to Newt Rockney's club. His 114 yards topped all rushers. After achieving All-American status at Stanford, the talented Nevers was both a pitcher for the Major League St. Louis Browns and a fullback for the Duluth Eskimos in the NFL in 1926 and 1927. He apparently retired as a football player in 1928 and became an assistant football coach back at Stanford before signing a contract with the Chicago Cardinals on July 30th, 1929. Nevers was considered an Iron Man in college based on his refusal to rest during games, and he was no different during his three-year stint with the Cardinals. For example, once during an exhibition game, Nevers demonstrated that he competed no differently whether it was a practice game or a battle for the NFL championship. What few realize is that Nevers rarely left the field, even during those practice games. He always expected to play the full 60 minutes on both offense and defense. During that exhibition game, the Cardinals, who were also coached by Nevers at the time, were safely ahead 33-6 late in the fourth quarter when an eager substitute for the Cardinals raced onto the field and reported to the referee and said, I'm playing right end, the end goes to fullback, and Nevers goes out. Upon overhearing this information, Nevers rushed rushed up to the official and shouted, Who in the hell says Nevers is going out? Get this straight. I'm running this team and not these guys on the bench. I'm not taking myself out until the game is in the bag. Well, one could not blame him. After all, the Cardinals in this practice game were only up by 27 in the fourth quarter and there was still over four minutes left but that was the competitive nature of Ernie Nevers. But back to Ernie's big day. As the Cardinals, who were 4-5-1 and one at the time, prepared to host the Bears 4-6-1 and one for the annual Thanksgiving Day encounter between the two fierce rivals on November 28, 1929, the championship hopes for both squads had long been extinguished. Instead, the Chicago Tribune noted... As usual, percentages, defeats, and victories are forgotten. It'll be Red Grange versus Ernie Nevers, and North Side against South Side. Nevers was still upset over a scoreless tie between the teams earlier that year and stated after the game, I told my players the next time we meet the Bears, we'll beat the hell out of them. I knew we could, I just knew it. Just four days before, Nevers had scored all of the Cardinals' points in a 19-0 win over the Dayton Triangles, but he was obviously ready for the Bears despite the short rest. However, if the thought of facing the arch-rival Bears was not enough incentive for Nevers, a nationwide wire story broke that very same morning of November 28th. It savagely ripped Nevers and other NFL backfield stars. Writer David S. Walsh claimed that none of the former college stars now playing in the pro circuit, except perhaps for Benny Friedman of the Giants, had ever matched their collegiate heroics. As Davis moaned, I mean that the ride of the campus, the lad who sets the world agog with his deeds for the dear old school, generally turns out to be just another football player once he finds himself in the unromantic atmosphere of the professional game. There are a few exceptions to this rule. Walsh then proceeded to bash Red Grange, Wildcat Wilson, and even the legendary Jim Thorpe, but was extremely diligent in his mockery of Nevers chiding. Ernie Nevers afforded an even more poignant example of a post-college retrogression. In fact, I doubt whether he even stood out too boldly as the individual star of his team. While we're not sure what Mr. Walsh was tasting when he wrote this drivel, Nevers most certainly must have seen or heard about the scathing article. With sports writer Walsh nowhere in sight, Nevers would need to target the Bears' defense for his immediate retribution. 
Under snowy, wet conditions, a sparse crowd of 8,000 at Comiskey Park watched his never scored a pair of touchdowns in the first quarter, adding one extra point as well to boost the Cardinals to an early 13-0 lead. The solid cards front line, buoyed by Duke Slater, Herb Bloomer, and Walt Kiesling, blasted huge holes in the Bears' defense, enabling Nevers to tally another TD from six yards out and adding the extra point in the second stanza to move the cards ahead 20-0 at the half. Reporter Wilfred Smith commented on the fierce line play. The Cardinals' line was the foundation on which these ball carriers built their successes, and it played no favorites. From end to end, the bear line wavered and retreated before massed interference, said Smith. Although the bear scored once in the third period, there was no stopping the rushing carnage of the Cardinals, as Nevers added three more scores in the second half, along with a pair of extra points to solidify the final 40-6 to six victory for the South Siders. Reporter Edgar Munzel of the Chicago Herald Examiner was exuberant in his praise for tackle Duke Slater, saying that Duke Slater, the veteran tackle, seemed the dominant figure in that forward wall, which had the Bears' front wobbly. Indeed, the headline from the Examiner stated, Slater rips gaps in Northsiders' line as Ernie shatters pro precedence. Overall, the blocking for Nevers was so effective that on four of his six touchdowns, he was untouched as he crossed into the end zone. Wilfred Smith concluded his Tribune article recalling when Nevers left the field late in the contest. Smith said, Then Ernie left the game and how those Southsiders cheered, and well they might. 40 points plus 19 points against Dayton last Sunday gave him 59 in a row, which is some kind of record. But the South Side didn't care, for the Cardinals had defeated the Bears. As for Nevers, he shunned the spotlight after his record performance and instead pointed over to his linemen in the locker room and asked, what about the horses up front? They made it all possible. And what about that article so critical of Nevers, Grange, and Thorpe? Perhaps author Davis S. Walsh may have noticed the devastating performance of Nevers on the same day that his unflattering article was published. And most certainly he noticed when Thorpe, Grange, and Nevers were all selected in the very first class of the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1963. Thank you for joining us on the Sports History Network, and we look forward to talking with you next time as we explore how a quarterback for the Cardinals could experience the very worst possible day in NFL history, yet still be honored as an All-Pro that very same year. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday's Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.